Thank you very much, Professor Teng, for your kind introduction. And thank you to the organisers for inviting me to this excellent conference. I'm very sad that I'm not there in person in my favourite part of the world, but perhaps next year. So, um, Angela, are you able to enlarge those slides? I can only see them, even though it's on speaker view, as a very tiny room. What I plan to talk about today is a clinician's viewpoint of why therapeutic drug monitoring for the antifungal drugs is extremely important. So there's been growing interest in the azole antifungal drugs for well over 20 years with a significant increase in publications concerning the azole antifungal therapeutic drug monitoring with the majority of papers concerning voriconazole, a drug that was initially and is still actually marketed as a standard one size fits all dosing regimen. Today, I really hope to show you why as a clinician, I consider therapeutic drug monitoring to be essential in many clinical settings. I will concentrate primarily on voriconazole, but briefly mention towards the end why TDM should also be considered for isabuconazole, posiconazole, fluconazole, and the echinocandins in specific circumstances. So here you can see the azole therapeutic drug monitoring ranges that we aim to achieve for voriconazole, a efficacy concentration of one to two, and a uh, toxicity concentration of around five to six. Whereas for posiconazole, it is a trough for prophylaxis of 0.7, for treatment of 1.5, and the upper, upper concentration for toxicity is uncertain, but probably around four to 4.5. Now, to look at voriconazole. This was said by uh, Van Van in, in 2014 and remains very true to today. Voriconazole concentrations display a large variability which cannot be explained by completely known factors. And even back in the early days when voriconazole was first looked at by people such as Steve Trefilio, it was quite clearly recognised that the dose of voriconazole or absolutely no resemblance to the concentration achieved. And so this highlights the principle that drug concentrations cause drug effects and not the actual dose that you give the patient. And this is particularly important with fixed dosing that occurs with many of the drugs that we use. Now we know that about half of the variation in voriconazole is due to genetic polymorphisms and you can have extensive metabolizers, poor metabolizers, and the fairly recently identified STAR-17, which is a very rapid metabolizer of voriconazole. Voriconazole may also undergo auto-induction over time. And David Denning recognized back in 2002 in some of the very early work on voriconazole that the concentrations can vary up to a hundredfold in patients receiving fixed dosages. So this is a drug that is ripe for TDM. So the first case I want to present is one we had in recently, a 78-year-old man with severe myelodysplastic syndrome who was admitted to the intensive care unit with an ESBL E. coli sepsis. He had a pulmonary lesion on his admission CT scan, which showed a halo sign highly suggestive of pulmonary aspergillosis, and he had had no prior azole prophylaxis. He was given the standard loading and maintenance doses of voriconazole, but had a trough concentration done on day three, which was very high at 10.6, so about, about double a recommended upper limit. So at that stage, his dose was reduced to 100 milligrams per day, and over the next few days, the trough concentration fell to the lower limit of the therapeutic range. What is happening in our patient? So this phenomenon was first recognised by Jan de Alfenar's group, back in around 2016. And they recognised the large variability in voriconazole concentrations, not only between patients, but also within individual patients over time. And it's been known since the late 1990s that inflammatory stimuli can change the activities and expressions of various forms of cytochrome chrome P450 enzymes. And the down regulation of cytochrome P450 enzymes during inflammation decreases the hepatic clearance of drugs metabolized by these enzymes. And we know that voriconazole is metabolized by 2C19, 2C9 and 3A4. So inflammation may well contribute to the variability of voriconazole pharmacokinetics. So in this initial study, 
This group did a retrospective chart review. They excluded all patients receiving other drugs that may inhibit or induce voriconazole metabolism. And they did a voriconazole serum concentration and a C-reactive protein on the same day. And they divided the patients into no to mild inflammation, moderate inflammation, or severe inflammation according to the CRP. And here you can see that a dose for the, a dose of, sorry, adjusted for the dose of voriconazole, that the concentration, the median trough concentration marks, uh, rises markedly as the CRP rises. So here at a low CRP, the median is 1.6, rising to 3.4. And when the CRP is over 200, for the same given dose, the trough is 6.2. And they showed by multiple, multiple linear regression analysis that every one milligram per litre in CRP, the voriconazole trough concentration increases by 0.015. So at a CRP of 300, you would expect an increase in the voriconazole trough concentration of 4.5. The same group went on to do a prospective study where they looked at 489 voriconazole concentrations measured in 34 patients. And they again clearly showed in this prospective study that voriconazole meta metabolism is decreased during inflammation. And they recommend frequent monitoring during and after severe inflammation. And just to give you an idea of how the CRP has an impact on the, the concentration, you can see if your baseline concentration is three, so well within the therapeutic range, by the time the CRP gets to 100, you're starting to enter the toxic range. Whereas if your baseline is one, it takes a CRP of 300 to reach that toxic range. Interestingly, this does not appear to be important in children. It's probably because they have a higher metabolic activity in their liver, which can compensate for the decrease in enzyme expression due to inflammation. But at the other end of life, we can see here this, this paper, which looks at TDM of voriconazole in elderly patients, that the median for a given dose is significantly higher in, in group A, which is the elderly patients, than group B, which is adult patients. And you can see more patients in the elderly group are actually outside the therapeutic range within the toxic level than other adult patients. And very interestingly, given the association with inflammation, in this study, the procalcitonin concentration was significantly associated with the voriconazole trough concentration in elderly, but not in adult patients. So again, another signal that inflammation is very important. So what about our patient? So our patient was both elderly and inflammatory. So you can see here his initial trough concentration of voriconazole was 10.8 at a time when the CRP and procalcitonin were both significantly elevated. The dose was reduced at this point, but as you can see, as the CRP and procalcitonin fell, his voriconazole concentration verged on subtherapeutic, so it was again increased as the inflammation resolved at this time point. So without therapeutic drug monitoring, we may have had troubles with both toxicity and inadequate efficacy in this patient. Mm -hmm. The next case is a case from our heart lung transplant clinic. So this is a 21 year old woman who had a lung transplant in 2007, underwent antibody mediated rejection and was re-transplanted in September of last year. She had a methicillin sensitive staph aureus noted on her donor swabs and was commenced on flucloxacil on two days after the transplant when these swab results became available. However, she was only given a single two gram dose and then it was accidentally omitted until this error was realized until the 22nd of the 9th when she was recommenced on the standard dose of eight grams per day. We have a weekly meeting with the lung transplant team and the following week the registrar said this patient is suddenly subtherapeutic for voriconazole and tacrolimus. What is going on? And we can see here that her initial tacrolimus concentration was actually very high at the time the flucloxacillin was commenced. And in fact, it was so high, they did subsequent dose reductions and ceased it for several days. Voriconazole was also at the upper limit of the acceptable range. But when flucloxacillin was commenced, within 48 hours, both drugs plummeted. And you can see that the voriconazole remained subtherapeutic despite dose increases. And the tacrolimus again was subtherapeutic despite regular dose increases back up to the initial concentration that was actually toxic. And it was only on the 2nd of October when these drugs were ceased that the patient again became therapeutic for both. So this rang bells at this ward round. I knew I'd seen something on this somewhere. 
And I pulled out a paper from David Gordon's group in Adelaide, which showed a very similar phenomenon between voriconazole and flucloxacillin. So here you can see the voriconazole concentration, which is within the therapeutic range until the flucloxacillin is commenced, the greyish bar here, when it suddenly plummets and despite dose increases, which you can see here, stays very low until shortly after the flucloxacillin is ceased. And they postulated that this was a pregnant X receptor, which is a nuclear hormone receptor that induces 3A4 and 2CA9 activity in a genotype dependent manner. Subsequently, the Dutch did a study of 20 patients simultaneously receiving boriconazole and flucloxacillin. And they showed that around 11 out of the 20 patients, so approximately half, had subtherapeutic flu uh, voriconazole concentrations whilst on flucloxacillin with a median trough of only 0.2. The median voriconazole concentration in those who didn't have this, this interaction was 1.5. And dose increases in those 11 patients failed to actually cause a significant rise in the plasma concentration, apart from two patients who uh, achieved very high dosing regimens. So again, we can see that there may well be a genetic component with around half of these patients having this interaction. And a more recent study looked at 33 patients, 145 trough concentrations of voriconazole, 51 with and 50, I'm sorry, 94 without concomitant flucloxacillin. For those patients on the combination, the median trough was only 0.5. For those on voriconazole alone, the median trough was 3.5. And those patients who were subtherapeutic comprised 69% on the combination therapy, but only 7% on voriconazole alone. So again, this looks to be a very important interaction, as the, the title of the paper suggests, a combination to avoid, but one that you would not recognise without therapeutic drug monitoring. What about the tacrolimus side of our patient? So there's only one paper I could find, and that, this is actually from Melbourne. This was four heart transplant recipients who received both flucloxacillin and either everolimus or tacrolimus. And despite appropriate dose adjustments, all four patients developed rejection that was diagnosed within the uh, realm of a subtherapeutic immunosuppressant concentration. And despite increasing the, the uh, doses, the therapeutic range was not achieved. Once the flucloxacillin was ceased, there was a considerable increase in both tacrolimus and everolimus trough concentrations. Again, it was quite a rapid phenomenon. So the third case is just to highlight that this does not just occur in transplant patients. This is a very recent case from our intensive care unit, a 35-year-old morbidly obese male who was admitted uh, from an urgent extracorporeal membrane oxygenation transfer and su for support and ventilation in our unit. And he was transferred from another hospital on flucloxacillin therapy for staph aureus bacteremia and lung abscesses. On the 13th of October this year, we grew Aspergillus fumigatus from his bronchial washing. And because we knew of this interaction and because of his morbid obesity, he was actually given double the standard loading dose and maintenance dose of voriconazole. However, you can see that despite this, his voriconazole dropped immediately that the um, initial loading dose was given and remained extremely low until this point where we ceased the flucloxacillin and he was changed to kefazolin. And subsequently, there was not the rapid rise in voriconazole concentration we saw with the other patients, but a slow rise. And this led to the question, was extracorporeal membrane oxygenation responsible for this? There's not much out there on voriconazole and ECMO. These are three case reports. In the first one that's highlighted here, there was a significant increase in dose in voriconazole whilst the patient was on ECMO to achieve a therapeutic concentration. And once he was decannulated and the ECMO was ceased, the dose was reduced for similar concentrations. However, there are two other patients in the literature where this is described. One showed a rise in viriconazole concentrations on ECMO, and the other was unable to achieve therapeutic concentrations, so was changed to liposomal amphotericin B. So the impact is not clear from this, but just very recently, there's been a larger study published, which is a retrospective assessment of viriconazole exposure in patients on ECMO. They had 282 accessible patients, 145 during ECMO and 137 either before or after. And they showed that subtherapeutic concentrations were seen in 56% on ECMO and 39% on not on ECMO. And this was not statistically significant. And again, there was a, a 
quite a high variation, both inter and intrasubject variability in voriconazole trough concentrations that did not differ significantly between ECMO and not an ECMO sampling. So this really highlights the need for voriconazole TDM in every critically ill patient, whether they're on ECMO or not. It's important to recognise that approximately 50% overall was subtherapeutic. Now, just a couple of words about isavuconazole, the new kid on the block, and one that we've used sparingly to date because of its cost, but I think will come into greater use as we see more resistant organisms. So preclinical studies suggest that cytochrome P453A4 and to a lesser extent 3A5 are the ISO enzymes predominantly responsible for the metabolism of isavuconazole. And it's a sensitive substrate and moderate inhibitor of 3A4. So this suggests that drug interactions would be likely and therefore may suggest a role for therapeutic drug monitoring. So there's a recent paper that compared isavuconazole TDM with voriconazole TDM. Uh, there were only 35 patients in the isavuconazole arm versus 283 patients in the voriconazole arm, so not large numbers. But they did show that 83% within the isavuconazole arm were within the therapeutic range of 2 to 5.5, whereas the voriconazole, 67% only were within that therapeutic range. And a greater intra and inter individual coefficient of variation was seen for voriconazole compared with isavuconazole. So this is a, perhaps a signal that TDM may be slightly less necessary for this drug, but it is very early days and I think time will tell. But just to get back to our favourite drug interaction, what about isavuconazole and flucloxacillin? There have been three case reports published in the last couple of months suggesting that this may well be an important interaction with this drug combination as well. This was one case report of voriconazole and one of isavuconazole, and both were found to be significantly subtherapeutic. The second was two cases of receiving isavuconazole where therapeutic drug uh, concentrations could not be achieved in the presence of flucloxacillin despite dose escalation. So again, in the real world, drug interactions highlight the need for TDM. So very briefly on posiconazole, there are three formulations, the oral suspension, the delayed release tablet, and the IV formulation. And because of financial reasons, I'm aware that the oral suspension is used, still used in a number of areas in the world. Posiconazole is a potent inhibitor of 3A4, the tablets more so than the suspension, and also an inhibitor and substrate of pig like a protein. And this may lead to important interactions. It's not actually metabolized by 3A4, it's actually glucuronidated via the UGT1A4 pathway. And genetic variants of this pathway are described, but the significance of these for posiconazole is uncertain. However, it has been clearly shown that posiconazole concentrations are reduced in the presence of phenytoin, carbamazepine, rifampicin, rifibutin, and efavirenz, probably via the pig like a protein pathway. Now, the oral suspension is a difficult drug. It has saturable absorption. It has highly variable bioavailability orally. It needs to be given three to four times daily, so it's not very user friendly and has highly pH dependent absorption. It is not absorbed from an, a, an alkaline stomach. The newer delayed release gastro resistant film coated tablet is actually a coated in a pH sensitive polymer stabilizer. This means it's not released at the low stomach pH, but released at the neutral pH of the small intestine. And this increases the Cmax and the AUC significantly in healthy individuals. The exposure is also increased by fatty meals and it has the advantage of once daily dosing. So is this a better drug in the clinical setting? Well, the answer is probably yes. This is a study looked at leukemic patients who were switched from the suspension to the solid formulation and found that the median plasma concentration more than doubled following this switch. However, it's likely the exposure may remain an issue for obese patients with a body mass index of greater than 30 or for patients with diarrhea. Now, why do we worry about the exposure of posiconazole, given that the tablets do seem to be better in attaining the target? We worry because if you look at therapeutic drug monitoring and posiconazole and look at the MICs of organisms, you can see that once the MIC rises above about 0.25, you need to actually increase the dose regardless of the formulation. 
And once it reaches um, two point, sorry, uh, 1.25, I think that is, it's very hard to see on this screen, you can see that no matter what formulation of prosiconazole you use, you are not going to achieve the concentrations required to inhibit microorganisms. So the posiconazole concentration is extremely important if you're in the range of organisms with higher MICs, such as perhaps some of the zygomycetes. And it has been clinically described, even with the newer formulations, that posiconazole can fail to achieve therapeutic concentrations. This was a leukemic patient with hyperbilirubinemia and hypoalbuminemia who failed to achieve posiconazole concentrations within the therapeutic range despite dose escalation. And it was not certain whether the unbound fraction, therefore the more rapidly metabolized fraction, uh, was increased by hypoalbuminemia or the upregulation of glucuronidation, glucuronidation pathway was due to hyperbilirubinemia. But again, a warning that posiconazole, despite the newer formulations, may need TDM. So what about fluconazole? fluconazole uh, this is a case of therapeutic failure. So this is a patient we had in our heart transplant unit who was actually transplanted a long time ago in 2010, but was admitted more recently with a large empyema and sepsis. And we grew a candida dubliniensis from his blood cultures and pleural fluid at decortication. He had post-operative renal failure and was commenced on CVVHD and fluconazole at the standard dose of 400 milligrams per day. He had a very stormy course and remained on renal replacement therapy. And on day 14, we continued to grow candida dubliniensis from his pleural fluid. He was changed to Casper fungum, but this failed to sterilize the pleural fluid. And he was subsequently changed to voriconazole and finally became culture negative on day 30. So why did this patient fail? We know that candida dubliniensis can become resistant to fluconazole, as is well described in the literature. We know that infection at a sanctuary site, such as pleural fluid, is more difficult to treat, and this may well be why the echinocandin failed, because it does not penetrate well into pleural fluid. Or finally, the dose of fluconazole, despite being according to guidelines, was inadequate for a patient with renal failure and renal replacement therapy. So fluconazole is said to be almost the ideal drug. It has a linear and predictable pharmacokinetic um, properties over a dose range of 50 to 800 milligrams a day in patients with normal renal function and it's 80 percent renal excreted and the area under the curve approximates the administered dose of the drug so for a dose of 800 milligrams it is said to produce an area under the curve of 800 milligrams per liter and it's said to have very predictable levels with every 100 milligrams of fluconazole resulting in a level of five micrograms per mil. So in other words, for 800, we would expect a serum concentration of around 40. And it's said in previous literature that routine therapeutic drug monitoring is not required, but may be appropriate for sanctuary site infections and treatment of isolates with reduced susceptibility or children. So this is just a quick snapshot of five patients we had in our intensive care unit at St Vincent's, many of whom are on renal replacement therapy and or extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. And you can see that if we dose them according to the antibiotic guidelines, uh, which are available to us in Australia, that in fact the concentrations of these drugs would have been subtherapeutic given an AUC MIC target of greater than 100, which for an organism with an MIC of 4 would be an AUC of 400. So you can see that all of these patients would have been subtherapeutic on standard dosing. And it was only when we optimized the dose with TDM that you can see that we reached the appropriate range for AUC over MIC target. So adhering to fluconazole standard treatment regimens may result in significant underdosing in critically ill patients. And therapeutic drug monitoring, I feel, should be recommended in any unstable patient patient undergoing renal replacement therapy or obesity. And just as a postscript on our heart transplant patient, we retrieved a stored serum specimen on this patient and ran the fluconazole concentration retrospectively, and it was only 4.2, whereas the predicted would have been 20. So he failed to clear his infection because of subtherapeutic dosing. And I've been involved very recently with the Dutch group of Jan Willem Alphenaar, where we looked at fluconazole concentrations in 33 patients in our intensive care unit and showed very substantial variability with over 50% underexposed, but 20% potentially overexposed and did some very nice um, target attainment modeling, which shows that unless you give a substantial loading dose, 
or dose on a weight per kilogram, a milligram per kilogram basis, and give an elevated subsequent dose that sick patients in the critically uh, in the intensive care unit are very likely to be underdosed. And fluconazole TDM guided dosing is recommended to op optimize therapy. And very recently, a position paper on antimicrobial therapy in intensive care has been published. I was privileged to be a part of this. And again, you can see dosing in critically ill patients suggests a far higher loading dose of 12 milligrams per kilo, not the 800 recommended in the literature, followed by a maintenance dose of six to 12 milligrams per kilo to achieve either a high or low AUC over MIC ratio, according to the MIC of the organism. So we really are underdosing fluconazole in critically ill patients. Now, just to move very briefly in the last few minutes to the echinocandins. So there's much less interest in the echinocandins than the azoles, and that's possibly because they're said to be very non-toxic, very predictable drugs. And yet, as you'll see, maybe there is a role for therapeutic drug monitoring. So what about critically ill patients? Um, Jason Roberts and Jeff Littman, who you'll hear from later, led this study, the DALI study, which was a prospective multi-centre study looking at concentrations of antimicrobial agents, including the antifungal drugs, at least five days after initiation of the drugs. And you can see that this study was a signal to the fact that, in fact, we may be underdosing these drugs in the critical care setting. So for anidular fungin, if we look at standard patients versus critically ill patients, the AUC, the Cmax and the Cmin are all reduced by approximately 50% in the critical care setting. Very similar results for Casper fungin, around 50% reduction in the critical care setting versus normal volunteers. So in this patient group, I think it, it does provide evidence we may well be underdosing in the critical care setting. And subsequent pub publications, many from the Dutch groups again, have shown that we probably in fact are. So for anidular fungin, it's, the exposure is less than healthy volunteers, but the clinical significance was not certain. There's no uh, specific parameters associated with underexposure. However, the lower concentration on day three than day seven suggests that as you want that impact on front, a bigger loading dose may well be beneficial. What about mycofungin? Well, for mycofungin, a similar finding, although in fact the concentrations were significantly reduced in the setting of critical care compared with normal volunteers. And it was shown that 75% of patients would not achieve the pharmacokinetic target of AUC greater than 90. So these authors gave four possible explanations for this. Is it altered protein binding, hypoalbuminemia, meaning greater clearance? Is it changes in the metabolic pathway? Is it the impact of disease severity? Or is it the higher average body weight in this cohort than a reference population? And they concluded that healthier patients weighing more than 100 kilograms, receiving 100 milligrams of mycofungin a day, are at risk for inappropriate mycofungin exposure and inadequate antifungal therapy. Another paper looked at Casper fungin and showed exposure was low in 50% of patients receiving the standard dosing. And they found a significant signal for weight in the study. And they felt that a weight-based dose regimen of one milligram per kilo per day should be given for patients with increased volume of distribution and clearance, which most of these critically ill patients are. What about ECMO? The jury is out both ECMO and renal replacement therapy. There's a paediatric paper which showed underdosing. There are several other papers which showed reduced, but probably adequate dosing. Finally, obesity, just a couple of words about this. As our population grows in size, so there've been several modeling papers which showed basically that for all the echinocandins, once you get above 66 kilograms, you should be dosing on a weight-based basis. Uh, this patient looked at anidular fungin pharmacokinetics and again showed that as weight increases, both the loading and maintenance doses should increase by approximately 15%. Whereas this paper showed a 25% increase in loading and maintenance dose once the weight went above 140 kilograms. So again, significant suggestions that obesity should result in higher doses of the echinocandins. Uh, so in conclusion, Complex patients have very complex physiology and complex and often unexpected drug interactions. Whatever drug you choose, you should ensure that the dosing is optimized for the patient with particular emphasis on potential drug interactions 
obesity and critically ill patients. A-grade evidence may not be available, but TDM is relatively cheap and increasingly available. Antifungal drugs are expensive and other diagnostic procedures such as the galactomannan and PET CT and other images, imaging modalities are expensive. So if you can prevent escalation or failure of treatment or combination antifungal treatment by performing TDM, it is highly cost effective. And just to finish up, a bit of free publicity. Australia put in a joint bid with our colleagues in Asia and the Pacific to hold the International Association for Therapeutic Drug Monitoring and Clinical Toxicology meeting in Singapore. And I'm very pleased to say that we were successful. I hope many of you who attend today's session will be inspired by TDM, become passionate about it and join us at this conference. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to take any questions.